Welcome back to the White Hat General Session. Um, we're thrilled. I hope that you enjoyed the first set of presenting companies. Um, I know that I enjoyed seeing all of their presentations as we were getting started. So now we're talking about family offices. I hear from so many people who say, how can you introduce me to the family offices? How do I connect with them? How do I talk with them? Um, oh, and would you give me your address book with all of their names? No. Um, but what I did do is I had a conversation with my friend Jamie. And I said, Jamie, let's have a family conversation at White Hat and have some experienced family office people with us and then take it from there. So I am gonna kick us off by asking our panelists to do a brief introduction of themselves so you know who they are. And, um, and then we're gonna get into some of the questions and we're gonna wrap this up on time. We are not gonna do Q&A. So if you have questions, they are gonna be here all day and you can connect and talk to them. And they're gonna actually tell you how to do it. <clears throat> All right, so with that, Jimmy, you want to kick us off? Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody, um, and thank you. I live in Chicago, so it's good to come down here for this heat, and, uh, and uh, also Arizona sports, for that matter. <laughs> but <clears throat> I wanted to uh, just give you a little of my background. I spent 35 years at Morgan Stanley. Now, funny enough, it was in the wealth management area, which has some advantages. And then subsequently, I've, uh, I've uh, evolved into investment banking role. But where I got the passion was, uh, I was president of the student body at Iowa State. And uh, as it turns out, after I graduated some time, <coughs> I was uh, asked to be on the, uh, investment, uh, the investment research uh, uh, group uh, called ISERF, Iowa State University. Uh, research foundation and we had control over all the IP and then I figured out what I wanted to do in the rest of my life which was I began I got passion for for uh, commercialization and we had a big portfolio believe it or not the, the university you might not have ever heard of but uh, you know we did invent the facts the computer and a lot of other stuff but uh, with that um, then I started down the role of wanting to help companies like yourself. Uh, and it's not an easy task. I mean, what, what you're going through is, uh, in trying to raise capitals is difficult. But on the other hand, that's how America is great. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. My name's Dan Tolbert. I've been in the investment business now for 45 years. Um, 25 of those years, I was a senior managing director at Bear Stearns, where I ran large investment portfolios, did investment banking work. I helped co-found two biotech companies that eventually got their drugs to market and were publicly traded. Three or four other companies that didn't make it, that were unfortunate. So I've got experience as a founder and as a startup in biotech and pharmaceutical companies, um, as well as understanding Wall Street and funding. Currently, I work for two large family offices as director of their investments. So I thought it might be fun for us to talk about ways that we could help those of you that are founders on how to navigate the path toward funding. Great, and I think, you know, there's so many misconceptions about what family offices are and what they do. As a family office manager, <laughs> help them understand what family offices are and what they do. Sure, thanks Joan. So when you work for a family office like me, you really work for the family. And the fit of me as a director of investments is can I really appropriate and assimilate and translate the wishes and desires of what the family wants to do with their wealth into investments that are directed under many of their own passions. So the major objective when you're approaching a family office for you as a, as a founder is, 
is there a fit with what their passions are as a family, where they direct funding, line up with what you do as your company? If so, you're going to have a much higher likelihood of them getting behind you and backing you. Yeah, and, um, you know, families' offices take all shapes and sizes, right, Jamie? Right. And um, they're not all the same. You've That's, seen a lot of them as clients. I have, and uh, they're difficult to meet. But, you know, uh, it's important you understand, as Dan was saying, you know, what they're interested in and what they do. Because if you don't, you're just wasting your time. So somehow you need to know somebody or somebody have somebody on your board or somebody here in this group that can help you get to these people. It'll be more difficult if you call them directly, but you can, of course. That's, that's, a, that's a free country where you can do that. But the differences in family office are enormous. Some are big, some are small, some are uh, aggressive, some over time, you might find this interesting, but they look more like private equity firms. I work with one in, uh, in New York, uh, the, name of the, the name is Karl Marx, like, like Karl Marx that you know. And, and they, that's five generations, man. Mm -hmm. They look like a private equity firm. But, but guess what? They also have an investment bank. So they all take different colors, they invest differently, they're in different sectors. You know, unfortunately, the majority I see are involved with real estate. I hate real estate, you know? <laughs> but, but, you know, and I'm, I'm more interested in creation, which, which you guys are all doing. But they're all different. And, you know, it's interesting, and it, I was sharing with Dan last night. So what is now my family's family office started six generations ago. And the way we transferred wealth from generation to generation was different then. And so if you look at the basis of the sovereign wealth funds over time, which are mega family offices, yes, um, you know, the crown jewels are part of the sovereign wealth fund for the queen, for now the king of England, right? And, you know, multi-generations ago, it was transferred in property, in jewelry, in, in things of that nature. And, you know, this ring that many of you have seen me wear is actually from, has been in my family for six generations. Wow. And, um, you know, was mined during the time of the Ra and the whole bit. Um, and so there are things in our family documents that when this ring came to me as now the matriarch of the family, as the generations have moved on, um, but I have instructions that I have to give it to my eldest granddaughter when she comes to that age. And so when we now have, and really it's been the last hundred years or so that we've had formal family office structures legally, and um, those structures are as unique as the family and how the family works. So, um, you know, Dan, just as an example, you said you're working with two families. Let's do a compare and contrast. How are those families different? Because families are people. Yes. Well, they're people, and because people are different, there's different preferences there. And so it, part of the thought that I'd like to share with you, the most important theme for most of you are scientists, certainly entrepreneurs, but it's really more about the EQ that you have, the emotional intelligence you have, than the IQ. Most of the very sophisticated foundations and family offices like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, they have teams of highly sophisticated, specialized people to, to vet investment opportunities. But typically for families that left it less than 200 to $400 million, I mean, they've got a staff of a handful of people. And they don't, they're not subject matter experts in the area of your company. So how do you get through to them? You get through to them with EQ. And the primary way you do that is to do some research on their passions and what they care about. Tammy, in the breakout sessions, her daughter got Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. So Tammy's targeted family to talk to. It's somebody that would align with Lyme disease mm -hmm. 
or infectious diseases as a corollary. So part of the thought is that when you're looking to get introduced to them, start with what I call centers of influence, your attorneys, your tax people, wealthy people in the community, other connections you have that know them, and to ask them once you get it down. But it's important for each of you, I think, to have a very crisp mission statement. And when, as a family office chair, when I get pitched probably 150, 200 times a year, is how clear is their mission statement? Like last night, the mission statement was, we're gonna cure cancer by creating a vaccine. Click, I get it. And so if you connect as a family office chair with that mission statement, you're gonna look deeper. You're gonna ask those questions and wanna meet you. So it's really about being more other-centered and really helping to define the problem first rather than pitching your solution. Because every solution really only has a value when it solves a problem. Like Tammy's company today, she's got a clinical treatment for testing to validate Lyme disease. And early treatment of Lyme disease dramatically increases the survivability and the patient outcome. So she can basically create a test where she can get a result in a couple of days instead of several weeks of confused data. So to tie up with people's passions, and most of those passions are shaped by their life experiences, maybe paternally passed down through their family, maybe they're in the banking business, it, they might be into horses, they might be into livestock or animals, but it's easy on foundation websites that list foundations because they're all publicly disclosed. They have to file a Form 990, which discloses where a lot of their money gets, gets spent. So foundations are required every year to give a percentage of their money away to as grants, generally five, six, seven percent of their assets. So all of that's disclosed. You can look where that money's gone. I know it's a lot of work, but when you go into that meeting when I've been researched and they actually know what our preferences are, it's they always, the meeting always is much more successful. Long answer. Good answer. Yep. And so, Jamie, there's building wealth, right? And then there's transferring wealth generationally. And there's also, sometimes within families, a disconnect from generation to generation on what the family thinks is important. That's true. Um, so when you're at Morgan Stanley, when we're working in you know, building wealth with people like that, you know, how, <clears throat> how did they look at their investing and their giving? And giving and investing are two very different things. Yes. Um, what did you kind of see with that? Well, one thing I saw was from generation to generation, uh, things change. Um, you know, uh, one thing, uh, and I'm going to kind of go off, off, off script here for one thing, second. If you look at the Walden family that owns Walmart. That lives here. After two generations now. Now, he was a staunch Republican guy. Now... These guys are looking at a lot more social types of things. And so what I want to talk about for just a second, um, one of the Waltons came to Chicago and started a whole new venture fund on climate change. Now, I can't see the grandfather doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what's going on. It, it's happening in Steve Jobs' family. So these things are all different in how they look at wealth. Unfortunately, and thank God for the wealthy families, because if we didn't have them, it would be tough to fund a number of the great technologies and, and uh, different efforts that we need to help our society. So in terms of it, it, Morgan Stanley, you know, what I saw was a bunch of bratty kids, you know, that, that, you know, wanted to spend their money on stuff. But the nice thing about family offices, generally, you're going to find a deeper commitment to the social good of the people. And so this happens over time. 
but uh, it's evolving and I wouldn't say that looking at the cover of it, it, it that you would anyone would understand what these people are passionate about. Hey, can I hit Jake on that? I, mean, I think that brings up a good point. Because being an investment manager for 40 years and looking at investments clinically, and at one point I managed $5 billion of assets under management. So looking at investment opportunities highly critically in terms of risk reward and investment performance in that space, but family offices do care about the investment return but they actually care more about, passionately more about the purpose of where that money goes. Yes, they want to make money, but what they really want to do most, what I want to do is I want to back people. And if I identify with a founder, I put my money by backing that founder, plus his vision and his team and his business plan. His pitch deck is important, but essentially I bet on the leadership. And I think most family offices that have any level of sophistication do the same thing. So, so a couple of thoughts for you to think about. Um, attend angel investing groups. I lived for a couple of years in Park City and Salt Lake City, a really strong dynamic area. It's now called Silicon Slopes instead of Silicon Valley because mm -hmm. a lot of the refugees from Palo Alto have moved to Utah. They want a more conservative state. They want more affordable housing. They want to ski and mountain bike and enjoy the outdoors. So there are enormous opportunities there. So as a Park City Angel and as a Salt Lake City Angel, I've heard three pitches today that I'm sure you could get funding from by attending Park City Angels and, and some of those introductions. So I think it could be important, yeah. Joan, maybe we end up creating like a referral network for angel investing funds. Because then if you come to me as a family office head and say, look, I've got a million dollar seed money funded from Park City Angels, you know, you're validated. And then secondly, with Kieran today and some of the presentations and Joaquim from Mayo, if you can get validation from a major teaching hospital, perhaps where you'll run the clinical trials, or you'll get a matching grant or funding from a Mayo. I mean, that's the good housekeeping seal of approval for an investor. And I think, you know, the other thing is the partnership between philanthropy, which a lot of philanthropy flows through family offices, and our hospitals. So um, just this week, it was announced a $150 million gift from the Stevenson's family um, to City of Hope to specifically focus on pancreas cancer. Yeah. And that particular gift, right, the, the, the NIH budget for, at NCI for pancreas cancer in a year is $50 million, right? So that gift is 3x what the NCI would spend in one year. And so families that feel deeply about something are going to make an impact, whether it's in, from an investment or from philanthropy. Um, and we were talking about, you know, AZ advances in the Arizona Health Innovation Trust Fund here in Arizona, we have some amazing angel groups. Our Desert Angels are here. Our um, ATI team is here. Arizona Tech Investors are here. And they do syndicate yeah. with, um, with, can with the folks up in Salt Lake, um, including my kid who is up there. <laughs> um, but he's doing pickleball. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, running the company, not playing it. But... As we look at you know, these various opportunities, um, I think it's really important to understand, you know, angels are people, right? When I was an angel, was doing angel investing, I worked hard for that money. That was my money. Yep. And you know, I, was, I was very vested in making sure that I was making good choices and looking for mentors and looking for guides. And with the family office, some of them have that same attitude. Some of them, as you said, have large investment teams and professionals like you. Um, and then there's the institutionals, the VCs. VCs and family offices are not the same thing. How are they different? Right. Well, venture capitalists look at emerging technologies and VCs have subject matter experts on where they deploy their capital, whether it's tech, emerging bio, mathematics, algorithms, AI. So 
venture capital firms are by their very nature, they employ the best of the best people with discernment to say, what's the execution risk in backing Jones' new company? And they put their money down knowing that seven, six, seven, eight of those are gonna wash out. But one or two or 20X or 30X, and that carries the fund. And maybe four or five of them make one to two X. So it's kind of a numbers game. And we create a concept in the investment business under modern portfolio theory called R squared. And it's essentially what's your risk adjusted return? So a 20 X sounds great, but when you look at the risk of it being a total wipeout, you might think of it differently. So what's your downside? What's your upside? How much risk are you taking and how much are you being paid to take that risk? So for those of you as founders, you have to minimize through the food chain of your pitch, execution risk. So a venture capital fund, an angel fund, investor fund, or a family office like me, we're all thinking through the chain of your, where's the execution risk? And, and, how, and, and most of them are thinking, we wanna be kind of certain of a good return, not hopeful of a really great return. That's kind of where the passion comes in. So yeah, they'll be willing to give you a lottery ticket on a 10% likelihood of success, but usually that's because of a passion that they really believe in. The investment family offices wanna be more certain of that return, so they're gonna gravitate to the lower risk companies that you're bringing out. Yeah, and you know, when we look at, um, you mentioned earlier, you know, some of these family offices are starting to look like PE firms. And we saw that first in real estate and then kind of transition into health. Right. Um, that really plays into the timelines of, you know, I, I've heard people say so often, well, family office is patient capital, you know, which makes the assumption mm -hmm. that all family offices are the same. But, you know, when you look at an angel investor, a PE firm, a family office, a venture capitalist, they have very distinct timelines. How do you have that conversation with the family office to understand how patient cap their capital might really be? Well, in general, the family offices have less rigor than a PE firm or a venture capital firm. Because PE firms and venture capital firms take money from investors. And generally, those funds have a life of generally not to exceed 10 years. And they want to basically pump the returns up because VC firms and PE firms take 20% of the cut of the value uplift in profits. So the sooner they turn a return, the more capital flows through to them as partners. So they're highly motivated to make money. Now they may defer a gain if there's a 2x greater gain by waiting two or three years, but they're about making money for themselves only by making money for their investors. Family offices, are designed more about staying wealthy, growing, preserving the needs of the family. It's a whole different magnetic north to their compass than a PE firm or a VC firm. Yeah. So, Chicago. So, and, and this is, there's, there's old money. California, there's a lot of new money. And that changes their perspective of the investors. And, and Jamie, you know, you've made your career nationally, but you're based in Chicago. That Rust Belt old family money, how is that different than the, the young Turks that are coming out today? Well, you know, one thing that's interesting, I wanted to bring up this to you. Do you want control investors or do you want investors that want to be a minority. Most of you are going to want a minority. You guys need to think about that before you even go talk to anybody because guess what? A lot of people just want to control and they want to buy it out. I talked to someone yesterday, we did, and uh, it's gotten an offer and they want to, and those guys want to control the whole thing. But guess what? It doesn't leave much for the entrepreneur. So we have to be very careful about who we talk to. For example, now going to your question, the older investors, like in Chicago, the Crown family, which is a big family, uh, they want to control, and, uh, and uh, at least they want to get to a point of control. So they're not going to be a very good spot for some of you here. 
There's other family offices that could be, um, but you need to know what stages they're investing in. And what I've seen is that the older, more mature organizations are um, more interested in making, here's another thing, what size check will they write? Some won't write less than 50 million. That's a big number. So, you know, we gotta, we gotta go to make sure we go to the family offices that are aligned with you. But in the Midwest, I see a little more about con capital preservation and control. And one thing that's important is that what, as these families grow, they get lots and lots of members who have lots and lots of different needs. And so that'll change. Now, one family I just talked to, uh, I, I don't mind mentioning them, Duchess Law is a very good family in Chicago. They, they now have gone from control to silent partner. Now that interests me more. So I know I'm gonna be working with them more because my audience are people that don't want control. So they evolve. This one went from control to non-control. Very interesting. And Craig Duchesswas started a venture capital firm in Austin yeah. as a way to get more deal flow mm -hmm. yeah. for his family to invest in. And we're seeing more of that. And we're also seeing the foreign families come in. New York is a hotbed for that right now. You look at A-Star and some of the other families yes. that have set up in New York. And, but I hope what you're taking away from this is every family office starts with a family. And each family is different just as your families are different. Um, and that's my closing thought, but I, Dan? Dan, well, just one second. Dan, sure, could you sorry. talk just before we jump in, if you don't mind? No, go ahead. How, you just had a great thought about how, what's the best way to approach a family office? And I, I think Dan has some really good points here. Go ahead, Dan. Well, thank you. Um, I think if I were you as founders, um, I would try to connect through a center of influence. A center of influence could be an attorney, a wealthy friend, somebody you might know from your church, somebody you might know from your golf club. But basically create a list of all the connections you have. Because if I could, like I was introduced to today's convention through my friend Jamie. He's my center of influence. Mm -hmm. So he created a wider net for me now by bringing me here. The same thing works for you. And it's always better to have validation from somebody who is a center of influence. So your attorneys, your, your tax preparers, professionals, people that are on boards, on charities. Um, and I, I think what I, I, I wanna also go back to, when you, add, when you have a, a family office as an investor in your company, you have the opportunity to not only get their, their money, but you get their time and their talents. Because now they become kind of stranded capital in your company. And so if there's a second round needed, do they walk away from the stranded capital if you can't fund it? So they're more likely to be invested in you emotionally. So the greater you can get them connected through the food chain of needs of your company, and if you can have their time, talent, and treasure, they're a partner for life. They're, in essence, a friend that sticks closer than a brother. They're not just on your advisory you know, um, team. They're literally a soulmate for you living and ble mm. ble bleeding with your business. That's, That's kind of my closing thought. It's about building those relationships with like-minded people that share your vision. More EQ than IQ. Awesome. Jamie? Yeah, my, my thoughts are more along, you know, I'm, kind of the deep business guy, what well, Dan is too, but don't waste time. Don't waste time. Really be thoughtful. Don't, don't go to events to go meet people. That's the kind of crap I did. But you don't need to do that. You, you, you need to, as a younger person, you need to focus on what Dan's talking about and use everybody you know. And by the way, you know, I, I see some startups that don't, Go to friends and family. Absolutely go to friends and family. That's a validation of you. And so usually when startups don't go to friends and family, I, you know, I shy away. But it's really important. 
that you don't waste time because you have very little time. And once the worst thing is, you want to be building your not company, not going out and getting money. So you've got to do that. And you need to know people like us, and there are people like us around you that can go, well, I can make those introductions because they, they, they know. I mean, I spend, uh, I go to 20 to 30 conferences a year. Why? Because I meet family offices that I get to know and I can call them. And that is a good thing, but you guys don't have the time for that. So use your time wisely. Awesome. So um, we're wrapping up this panel because we have a new group of fabulous companies that are gonna be kicking off in the pitch rooms. And um, so enjoy this next session from 11 to 12. Be back here at 12 o'clock. We're gonna be kicking off with Mike Idol from JP Morgan to understand what the investment landscape looks like as we look forward. So um, guys, Dan, thank, thank you. You, so. you are awesome. Jamie, you can take me out to lunch at Christmas time anytime. <laughs> That'd be good. And you, you look kind of Christmassy right now. All right. Thanks everybody. <laughs> thank you.